I'd like to start off tonight by sharing with you a text message that I got uh, one day last fall while walking to my office. It was sent directly from the brain of a person who was paralyzed from the neck down using only his thoughts and some clever computer software. This was, in fact, the second text message he had ever sent. Text messaging was invented before he had his injury. Let me tell you who he sent the first message to. It was to a, a very, very special person in his life. As you can tell, I was pretty excited about that. But, uh, you know, in fact, I, I, I could say that I've probably been working towards this most of my life. On my fourth birthday, my family of five was happy and healthy, and my dad was an engaged and attentive parent. Six months later, he was involved in a terrible car accident that left him barely able to move or speak. I grew up barely knowing him, frustrated that I was really unable to understand the things that he wanted to tell me. In my young child's mind, there had to be something that could be done, some way to fix this problem that the adults said couldn't be fixed. I was inspired by science fiction, by, for example, a novel that explored the possibility of hooking a person's brain up to a starship. Imagine the kind of freedom that you could get from that. But the more I learned about the complexities of the brain, the more difficult the problem became. How to take those signals from an intact brain and bypass a damaged body? The answer lay in understanding the language of the brain. The way we do this is through a phrase book that's been developed over decades of neuroscience research to translate what the neurons, the citizens of the brain, are saying into a language that our computer systems, for example, can understand. By decoding that language, we can use it to control our starship or to control a cursor on a screen. The very best way to read these signals out from the neurons of the brain is to get very close to them. And the way we do this in our laboratory is by using a tiny sensor, which is four by four millimeters, about the size of a baby aspirin, that extends just into the outer layers of the brain. This array of, of 100 silicon electrodes nestles down among the cells that control uh, action on the opposite side of the body. These neurons communicate with tiny pulses uh, of electricity called action potentials. The, uh, the probes in this region can pick up uh, action potentials from one or many neurons. So we can uh, read out the activity across the entire array. We're listening to the opinions of our neural citizens. The signals are then amplified, uh, routed out of the brain, and digitized. Once in digital form, we can analyze them like any other data. So for example, we can apply our phrasebook to decode that language of the brain. Uh, one of the things that we use to our advantage is that we've learned, again, through the use of this phrasebook, that, that neurons communicate by how fast or how slow they fire. So by firing more rapidly, they communicate that they like something better, and by firing more slowly, they don't like it. We can think of it as hooking up an applause meter to the brain. So for example, this neuron may respond like crazy when I'm moving my, my hand to the left, so it, it votes by applauding. So we know that this neuron likes a leftward movement. This neuron may not care if I'm moving my arm down, but claps like crazy when I'm moving it up. So this neuron is voting for an upward movement. By denoting each one of these uh, arrows, or preferred directions, uh, by size, we can read out uh, the entire uh, action across the entire array on a second-by-second -second basis. We can tell how these neurons are voting. So for example, if I want to move up and to the left to, to touch this target on the screen, the ensemble population, the way the neurons are voting, tells us which way that cursor is going to move. This has finally given me the tools to realize my dream of restoring function to people with paralysis. Our research participants, using this technology, uh, can use an unmodified Android tablet to, search the, to surf the web, to write text messages, to communicate with loved ones in the way our participant has, has done. I've been particularly inspired by this uh, terrific book by uh, Jean-Dominique Bobé, the, uh, the Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Many of you may be familiar with this. Uh, the former editor of, Mel, of Elle magazine, he, was, uh, uh, he uh, had a brainstem stroke which left him barely able to move or speak. He wrote this book one character at a time using eye blinks. Think of what he could have done with a better communication channel. Many of you may be familiar with ALS. One of, this is one of our research participants with ALS, a 52-year-old woman, who's using the innovations developed in our laboratory to type at about six words per minute, which is about half the speed uh, of a teenager texting on a, on a cell phone, uh, which, is, uh, which, which is pretty incredible. Our lab, one of our, one of our goals and one of the goals of the larger BrainGate Consortium, of which we're a part, 
is to provide the ability to use a computer 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, uh, using only thoughts. So the vision would be to plug a USB key into any computer and be able to immediately control it using your thoughts. We're really on the threshold, I believe, of uh, providing replacement circuits for the brain, routing around damaged areas by being able to use those signals to be able to then drive inputs that allow us to change the way the brain works, as we've just heard. As our phrasebook turns into a dictionary, as we learn more about the function of the brain and how it works and, and, uh, and how it communicates, uh, I believe that, that the sky is really the limit. As our technology continues to advance, uh, there, will be, there are going to be some ethical questions. We should think, what if we have the ability to give somebody the, uh, a superhuman cap cap uh, capacity or capability? Should we really do it? Uh, I don't know the answer to those questions because I think the technology is still in its infancy. But I think, again, going back to the example of our research participant, what we should really strive to do is allow people with disabilities to connect with loved ones on a daily basis. Thank you.